Cocaine Cowboys, The Deadly Rise of Ireland's Drug Lords, the live show is on sale now. We're on the road on February 10th at the Lime Tree Theatre in Limerick, February 15th in Cork's Everyman Theatre and on Sunday 18th we're back at Dublin's Three Olympia. April takes us to Galway's Town Hall Theatre, Killarney's INEC and Belfast's Waterfront Studios. Check mcd.ie or venue for ticket sales. We've had to edit a bit out of another one we've done there and we can't describe why, but just... No, but let's... Sometimes I go a step too far. There's no question about it, is there? There's, and sorry, but those cameras regularly. are confusing. They are confusing because it's... They are confusing. It's... it's So there's a mirror camera. There's a mirror camera. Yeah. And I was going like this. Why is that yeah, on why, the other side? And yes. It's... This is... This is real. That's real life. And that's the mirror. But you see, you can look over here. You don't have to look at them. They're no. constantly in my face there. They are. And I was wondering why my ear was sticking out, actually, and why that <laughs> ear was sticking out, not this one. That yeah. was what it was all about, but... Again, lost on the uh, listeners <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> ah, they can follow at this stage. They have an idea that we're here with cameras stuck in our faces every day. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we're going to talk about that heroin seizure at Weston Airport. Um, Weston Airport, of course, was once owned by the Mansfield family. It was. And it was the subject of a previous plot to import cocaine, yeah. which never arrived in Western Airport, but Western Airport, but which was uh, caught in. Uh, well, it was Belgium, Belgium I think. Yes, yeah, it was Belgium, and it was on a Mansfield-owned plane. And John Kinsella, the former boxer, was subsequently, I think, he pleaded guilty. Um, during his court case, there was some. Um, I'm slightly off of subject matter here, but this is interesting. Yeah. During his court case, there was uh, evidence given there was, I think they were up on the phones, the Belgians, and uh, he was in contact with, and there was a lot of talk of the owl fella as yeah. he was described. And of yeah. course, just as Tony Hunt in the court when he was, um, he was sentencing, Kinsella said that, you know, we never really got to the bottom of who the owl fella was. Shortly afterwards, Jim Mansfield Sr. came out uh, fighting talk, saying that uh, we are not criminals. And of course, we know what's happened since. Yeah. Um, Mansfield has passed away, but uh, evidence given in court earlier this year showed how uh, his son, Jimmy Jr., took 4.5 million euro of cash from Daniel Kinahan and Bomber Kavanagh to wash through the Mansfield property empire. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was a, a very famous case. John Kinsella was, of course, a very talented boxer, the real a real deal in terms of his boxing, and um, had set up a number of aviation companies. Um, had looked quite legitimate. Um, hadn't necessarily been hanging around with all the wrong people, and he was ultimately caught through basically through the, the Belgian police. Um, he was initially charged and went on a publicity campaign to say he was an innocent man caught up in this, ultimately was convicted. But I think what that highlighted at the time was um, that that while drugs coming through Dublin Airport or coming through the ports, there's very much uh, procedures in place that, that, that give the state a chance of catching these, certainly with the private airplanes at that time, uh, it sort of exposed a, a gap in security. Now, obviously not all drug dealers can can hire a plane, but there are some of them at that scale where you can see that would, it would make sense. But there Even are. Even in private planes, of course. And actually at the time, I think also um, Mansfield Senior said that not a single drug had passed through Western Airport, that, you know, there was no customs basically there. No. I was out there loads of times. Because yeah. we used to hire planes before drones came yeah. in. And we'd go up on those tiny little planes. We everyone on them. Oh, awesome. Terrifying. Oh. Like absolutely still wake up at night yeah. thinking I'm in the back of one of them. It's like being in the back of a little tin can. Yeah. Knees up to your chin. Right. And a photographer hanging out either window to try and get that aerial view. Yeah. I think actually at one point we did fly over all of that city west area, over cold water lakes, over yeah. number 10, of course, which was the house which was ultimately given to the Kinahans in um, replacement of the money that went into receivership. Um, and, you know, we did other kind of aerial stuff from out there. But it always struck me, you, you parked up at Weston and this is when it was in the previous ownership yeah. of the Mansfields, not um, 
I don't know who owns it now, actually, but you parked up and you just walk through. Yeah. And you get out and in your plane yeah. and you're back in. And there was a little kind of, um, there was one of those little x-ray things, but it just never seemed to be operating and there was never anyone no, I mean, there. obviously the, the 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 state, the aviation authorities in Ireland have access to all of the flight logs, every yeah. plane that lands. They have, customs have the same information and they do do checks and everything like that. But you can see why it might be, it's obviously not the, the, the same level of security doesn't go into that as Dublin Airport for obvious reasons. And what sort of a plane was this that was, do you know anything about this aircraft? I know it was a light aircraft, but I mean, was this one of the little tiny wee ones? Well, I mean, it, it was it, coming from Germany. So it must have been a bit bigger than what was... I'm frantically, I'm after asking you a question there and you don't. Oh, no, I don't. I do. Why? I do. I do it's it, like going into one of those shops it, where they have everything and then you hit them with, you know, yeah, you know, I mean, wasabi it, paste and they don't have it. Well, it is. It is. What type of, yeah. It's a good question, obviously. Really. Yeah. Eyebrow. I mean, pause intelligent it. question. No, let's not pause it. Let's just keep you under pressure there. Well, it's um, a little plain. It's a little bit. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> a little light aircraft. Yeah. But obviously, I mean, you know, these thing, this thing, I mean, it was crossing Europe or parts of Europe. Yeah, so it's a, like, it's a sort of, I think it was actually, the the name of the plane is there. It's it's a mid-range sort of plane and that, um, you know, they obviously, they had 58 uh, kilograms of her, of heroin in hold-all bags, vacuum packed. And obviously what happened was... Is that the plane? That's the plane there. And it probably so it says is teeny weeny. It, yeah, it's a small, it's a small it's plane. It's just one of the little things like I was on. Probably, The yeah. hold-all bags were in the back seats where I used to sit. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and I mean, 58 kil- kilograms of heroin. Which is worth about 8 million. Worth something like 8 million. Um, big, um, huge seizure of heroin. A big, probably, I mean, the biggest in, in in a long, long time. Yeah. I mean, 8 million pounds worth of heroin. If you look at the, 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 the scale of the heroin trade in Ireland relative to cocaine, I mean, it has become, the, the, the difference has grown greater and greater. Mm-hmm. Um, heroin is is a relatively niche business. So eight million pounds out of that would be a huge amount. Um, eight million pounds of cocaine, as we know at this point, is only uh, you know cover a couple of weekends. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But eight million pounds worth of heroin is very, very significant. Um, it would, you know, there, there's there's probably only a small number of of gangs who would have the capacity to pay for that, organize that and bring it in. And basically it comes down to to one gang known as the family who have become the absolute dominant player in the heroin trade. Mm. They've also become a very big players in the cocaine trade and other drugs and also in the sort of firearms trade. But in, in terms of heroin, they've become fully dominant. Yeah. And um, I think they're you know, probably the only gang that are wholesaling on that level, that are bringing in that amount. That are based within the country. That are based within the country. Mm. There are other gangs. Um, there's there's Eastern European gangs that are very heavily involved in the heroin trade as well. Um, certainly operating in rural Ireland with a very distinct structure. They're being known as the Russians, I think, but they're actually from various Eastern European countries. So there are big players and then there's a range of sort of, I suppose, what you'd call sort of mule smugglers that's Mm. sort of relatively solo operations that are maybe bringing in small amounts on ferries from the UK. But the family have have become big players in Europe and big players in the biggest player in Ireland in terms of heroin. And in particular, um, not just in Dublin, but but, uh, having contacts in Cork and Limerick and places like that. Just go back to heroin for one second because obviously the difference between heroin and cocaine yeah. is that heroin is a highly addictive drug. Yeah. It's the 24-7 drug. Yeah. Those dealing it, phones are going all the time, yeah. right? It, you don't take a day off from no. taking heroin. But interestingly, um, on the addiction side, in the teenage addiction services over the past few years, do you know how many people have been on it for heroin addiction? Well, I know it's much, much less, but go ahead. Zero. 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 Because um, it's like as if it's kind of going out of fashion, for want of a better word. There is, um, you know, that there is a a set amount, a finite amount, I suppose, of heroin users in the country. Now, it's still a lot of heroin users, Um, most of them in, in chronic addiction. There's very few, I think, users who kind of dip in and out of heroin. Most of them in chronic addiction. You see them all over the city yeah. and in 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 other cities, not just Dublin. Um, they need it. They 
will do anything to get that drug. Yeah. They ultimately need health care. Yeah. Unlike cocaine users who need a bit of a reality check as regards yeah. where their, you know, their fun is Look, I mean, is, is there, funding. is there recreational uses of heroin? I mean, there's very, very few. very few. So what you're talking about is the people who organize this shipment, they really are profiting off absolute human misery. Uh, I think you can, it's safe to say that. Like these people who make their money in this way, of of that heroin that's brought in, there's going to be overdoses, there's going to be family destruction, there's going to be all sorts of chronic problems. You know, if you were selling cocaine, maybe you can make an argument that people are going to take on the weekends and go back to work and everybody's doing it and what's, what it might as well be me. But if you're talking about wholesaling that amount of heroin into Ireland, you, you are literally going to be responsible mm-hmm. for people ultimately dying as a result of that addiction. And for a lot of uh, human misery besides, I mean, it is a, it's, it's, there is no moral argument to be made for that dealers of that and and you know that's that's we've seen that in this in Dublin over 40 years that that is the communities that were affected by by heroin make even them make a huge distinction between heroin dealing and other dealing mm. you know some people might say that's right or wrong but they know on the on the on the the ground level you know dealing heroin is 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 a deep wrong you know so as regards the family they don't only just deal it into these sort of um chaotic existences and you know cause all that merry misery but they are actually sort of two pronged in that they um use that kind of illness that people have they're notoriously um sort of predatory on even within their own areas on using heroin addicted people to store their product to move their product to um they they're sort of seen as almost using that sort of cuckoo method um if there's a a heroin addict who's maybe recovered they will lure them back by offering them free drugs and then getting them to store their, you know, their guns or whatever it is. I mean, I actually did a story on that, if you remember, a couple of years ago, and I was able to list out, I don't have the names to hand, but I was able to list out some people who'd been before the courts. And if you look back, if you look back into their stories, many of them had sort of made efforts at recovery, but were drawn back into it because the family gang wanted storage or wanted somebody to move things or to, you know, hand out or to deal for them or whatever. So they're a particularly um, predatory group, organised crime group. Yeah, I mean, it's, look, they, they, I think there was a number of cases where the drugs are being stored basically in West Dublin where this gang is based. Um, they'd be stored in houses in the area that could be moved on quickly. Um, a lot of these people, when they came before the courts who were found in possession of them, they would all give the same the same excuse, they would, the guards would almost universally stand up and say, look, these guys are obviously storing this heroin and they should, you know, serve their sentence or whatever, but mm. they're not on top of the the network and that they're being pressured into it. Um, people that are suffering from addiction are being offered a few thousand euros and they seem to have a network of how it would be collected and dropped by people in similar circumstances mm-hmm. as well. So it was it, somebody would store it, but they'd also have the you know couriers and and these these guys maybe in their thirties and forties with long term addiction problems who would be used to move the product around. Like we also know for a fact that they have probably clients around the country that were maybe uh, some of these the heroin was being moved down to places like Cork and Limerick on. By, by car, but also by train where people will come up and collect maybe, you know, 50, 60,000 pounds worth of heroin and bring it back down. And that seems to be a regular way of rather than um, moving somebody down there and dealing it from there that people were coming up and to collect, they would meet maybe one of these guys that were addicted with a suitcase or a bag or mm-hmm. whatever and it'd be handed over and they'd go back down to their to their county and that was being moved around Ireland in that way. Um, so it's, it does, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a grim trade, isn't it? And the family have been on the go for at least two decades. So they're centred in the Ballyfermot area. They're headed up by two brothers. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's estimates that there's sort of, you know, within the inner circle, there's only really about eight to 10 of them, but they are 
really have grown in significance. Now, a number of the key sort of lieutenants in the grouping have spent time in and out of jail, one in particular for another heroin related seizure. But since the sort of the decline and the dismantling of the Kinahan organization, the family have become the top target of the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau in this country. They have grown at a phenomenal rate. They moved into, as you mentioned at the beginning, cocaine, green as they call it. So they're selling everything now. Yeah. Um, they're a one-stop shop actually for drug gangs. And clearly their sophistication, I think, and where they have got to has been shown by the fact that they are privately flying in planes that the drugs into this country. Now, interestingly, this plane would have originated in Germany. And we were just saying between us there before we came on that the family were earlier linked to a massive big um, uh, heroin seizure in Germany back in 2019, where 600 kilos of it was found along the German and Polish border. And it was linked to a Turkish gang, which is where it's believed that the family have always been getting their supply from the yeah. Turks. So they haven't, while they were dealing heroin, while the Kinahan cartel would have had a stranglehold on a lot of the other gangs in the country, the family had their own wholesalers. They had their own guys out there who had no links to the Kinahans. No, I mean, I think, look, what I was always told was the Kinahan struck these exclusive deals with some of the Colombian cartels, that mm. they would be the only Irish people they would deal with. And the family did seem to source cocaine off the Kinahans as well mm. and worked with them. But the, the the heroin route is totally different. I mean, it basically comes from Afghanistan through... Turkey. Yeah, through Kazakhstan and through and Iran through t to Turkey. Now, Turkey obviously have a huge uh, expat community in, in Germany in particular, but also in, in, in Holland and places like that. But really, there's a lot, there's a huge expat. If you go to any German city, you'll see Turkish mm -hmm. communities there. So that was the route. It comes into Turkey and then it moves into Europe. Um, traditionally, even it went down to Italy and it was actually then exported to America from Italy, through, from Turkey to Italy. But it obviously then travels from Turkey into the, into the UK. In the UK, there's also a big expat Turkish community and the the Turkish mafia mm -hmm. in the UK are are also very big players. Even traditionally, were one of the biggest players in organised crime, um, and the family seems to have struck up long term ties with these people. And um, I think you wrote before that they were very trusted by those people. They would pay their debts. They would mm -hmm. keep quiet. They would not put them at risk and they had that long-term relationship and that had nothing to do with the Kinnons where they did seem to work with all sorts of other uh, criminal organisations in yeah. Spain around cocaine. They had their own deals with these Turkish-based mafia. Mm. And the other thing, of course, that the, the family were notorious for was not getting involved in feuds. Yeah. And, and, and in a way that I think sort of helped their rise in the background, that sort of what was a slow rise until the Kinahan organization began to fall circa 2016 and onwards. And then they're what has become this like, you know, enormous operation that they now are, are yeah. overseeing. Well, uh, they, they didn't get involved in these kind of tit for tat murders mm. for sure. But what we always have been told is that they were particularly ferocious in debt collecting mm. Um in using violence in debt collecting, uh, in threats of violence, threatening families, uh, using violence, you know, shootings or kneecappings, assaults to collect relatively small debts in their own community. Mm -hmm. So although they weren't associated with maybe feuding. that, that yeah. feuding, they were, they certainly were known for, for, for violence. Oh, so feared, so completely Very, feared. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? And with links with, with, you know, some of the more significant gangs in that area as well, who would be known as extortionists and all the rest of it. Um, so what happened was this plane landed, yeah, and yeah. it was 24 hours in the runway in Weston and there was obviously a surveillance operation around it. It was due to go, you thought, to Kildare. Yeah, so basically it landed. Um, the police, obviously, the guards, obviously, were all over it. Um, it landed and it stayed on the runway. Nothing was unpacked. It was being monitored this whole time. It seems to have stayed for at least 24 hours, maybe even longer, um, being watched the whole time. Um, at some point, they seem to have made a separate plan to fly off to another airfield. Um, 
the, the police are still watching and waiting for somebody to come. Obviously, their their preference would be for it to be unloaded, uh, for it to go somewhere, for, for it to be followed down to see who collected it or and try and 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 you know then then swoop in. But be, as the plane was due to fly off, I think they 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 had to move and they they took possession of of the heroin and arrested two men mm. who it's quite unusual it would sit on the runway for so long well i mean loaded with heroin you know well There's and, obviously some suspicions that well let's see that that is want to take it out, take the heroin off and of course we have seen that in the past mm. haven't we with shipments of cocaine that have sat there for weeks or even longer uh, as paranoia get, builds yeah people get spooked yeah and they they get afraid to collect it because they think they're being watched and, and listen they think they're being watched we're talking about them being watched the family we've yeah. been talking about them that they're you know a top target of the the drug and organized crime bureau since around 2020 so they know that yeah. they are under surveillance that they're being watched so clearly that would explain exactly yeah. if people got spooked why they got spooked but two men have been charged over um that seizure yeah, so and the, the pilot and another man who was there, um, they're both from Hungary. Um, We're not going to try, are we? Aradi Ignak, 49 of Kiksimit. Yeah, and, and Sultan Nemeth, a <laughs> 62-year-old. So they're both from, a, from Hungary. On. Yeah, but where in Hungary? The middle bit. S-U-K-O-S-D, try it. No, Sukst. Sukst. no, 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 that's definitely not right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they were detained under Section 50 of the Criminal Justice Act 2006 at Leakslip Garda Station. Yeah. And um, they were, it was interesting what they said in court or what was said to the court, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they were charged with these offences. They didn't uh, make a plea at that point. Mm. Um, they've been remanded in custody to appear at a further date. But during their... Uh, during the evidence, the guards described what what was said to them as they were charged and arrested, and um, the the first man, Mister Ignat, when it was put to him in bed, there was there was heroin found on the plane. I took, he said, I took it because I was forced to, and not because I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, the other man, Mister Nemeth, said um, he basically said we didn't in, in regard to him being hired to work on the plane. He said, we didn't speak about drugs. He then said it was, he, he was told it was to do with microchips or other metal. Special components. metal material. Yeah. And, he, and he, then he said definitively, I hate drugs. Mm. So that, that, that is what was said and they will appear at a later date now for a further hearing. I think they're back up on Monday morning. Okay. Right. Well, their story, no doubt, or their cases will play out before the courts and undoubtedly will move to a higher court. Um, so we won't say any more about them. But nonetheless, I suppose the, the Garda's fight against and this attempt to dismantle the family continues to foil their drug routes and uh, to, you know, to target and, and capture the, the, the top commanders of that grouping. Yeah, I mean, I think it must be getting uncomfortable for them now because you're seeing increasingly, and people will read it who read the papers will see this seizure being linked to the family, this yeah. cash seizure being linked to the family, this drug seizure. And eventually it's a it's a drip drip effect. And there certainly do seem to be, uh, the guards do seem to be making serious inroads into their operation. There's a sort of a blueprint for dismantling a large crime group like that, an organised crime group. And it is exactly that. It's relentless. It's going back and back and back for more. And um, it eventually does work. It because, does. Because... Uh, you know, none of these people that we're talking about are really probably going to uh, sail off into the... No, I mean, uh, they, some people in that organisation have, have had a, a good run. Mm. But these runs will come to an end and you can see that with, with the Kinnons over in Dubai. The and of course, the Criminal Assets those. Bureau are after them as well. So yeah. it's a multi-pronged approach. Okay, Niall, thanks a million. Thanks very much. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.